is a lifelong resident of Hopkinton, New Hampshire. Like a lot of independent rural Yankees, he's been a jack of many trades, a builder, logger, writer, teacher, radio voice, even an actor and director. So we're super excited to have him here, and I think it's going to be a great program, and I'm going to even stay for it. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jesse. I was remarkably efficient. <laughs> I follow up as well. Oh, OK. <laughs> Good. And I'm very grateful for, uh, to all of you for uh, taking the time to come on down here and listen to a total stranger uh, talk about rocks. My name is Kevin Gardner. I'm from Hopkinson, New Hampshire. You could call me a son of Hopkinson, New Hampshire, in fact, which makes me a grandson of Hopkinson, Massachusetts, since our Hopkinson uh, uh, was first settled by folks who came from down here uh, and therefore uh, got its name uh, from yours. I hope you're not angry with us for stealing your name. But I'm here today to talk about uh, our wonderful old New England store walls. I want to say some things to you about uh, where they came from, uh, what their history is, how they are put together, how their styles emerged and changed over time. I'm going to tell you a few things about some of these other books that I have brought, because as sad as it is to say, I am not the only person who ever wrote a book about New England stone walls. But I want to begin with a bit of a disclaimer. And that is this. If you happen to be sitting in a place where you can't really see what I am doing on this tabletop while I speak to you, please don't worry about it. It's got nothing at all to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just trying to keep my hands busy. And I would like to begin with a particular year. Very important year, as it turns out, in the history of our and that year was 1871. In 1871, our beloved U.S. Department of Agriculture decided it would be a great idea to take inventory of all the fencing in the United States. So they worked on this terribly important job for about a year, then released an enormous report full of many facts. Among them was this one that in the six New England states and the state of New York combined, in other words, the northeast corner of the United States, there were more than 250,000 miles of stone wall. 250,000 miles. That is more stone wall than there is railroad track in this country. It is more stone wall by a good long way than the entire length of the U.S. coastline. It is, in fact, enough stone wall to go all the way around the world. Ten times. It's, you're not impressed by that. It's even enough, <laughs> this is the last statistic, even enough to stretch from the parking lot outside this lovely, comfortable library to the surface of the moon. There are two notable things about this number. First one is that it is wrong. <laughs> it's too low by a long way. That's because the federal report on fencing only concerned itself with what it said it concerned itself with, which was barriers between sections of farmland, fences. Whereas anybody who's been in the Wayland for more than, oh, I don't know, 25 minutes knows that there are a great many more things here built out of what we call dry made stone, that is to say, structures that are held together by nothing more than their own weight and the skill of the person who puts them there. Many more things built this way uh, than merely offensive. Uh, they include, of course, ramps and causeways and stone-lined wells and culvert headers, the old town pounds, uh, and of course, thousands and thousands of foundations, such as houses and barns and buildings of all kinds. Taken together with these straightforward 250,000 miles plus of dry laid stone fence, it has been estimated by some people who perhaps became a bit overstimulated by this number uh, <laughs> that there is more dry laid stone in the northeastern United States than there is in the entire rest of the world combined. This is not an assertion I am personally prepared to back up. It is, however, notable that somebody even bothered to make this comparison, and it should give you some uh, notion of exactly how much of a communal architectural accomplishment these walls and other structures represent. Well, the second notable thing about this 250,000 mile number really doesn't have anything to do with the number itself, but rather with the year that it was arrived at. 
Guys, if you could pick a year, which we reached a kind of tipping point in this country, and began to lose more stone walls than we were gaining, uh, you could do quite a bit worse than fetch up on 1871. By that time, the kind of confluence of events that had been developing throughout the 19th century came to a head, if you will, and put an end to the long era uh, of dry laid stone wall construction, at least to the era in which it was being pursued on a vernacular basis by ordinary farmers and workers. The factors that went into the uh, end of this uh, era of widespread building stone walls were many and varied, and many of them have been developing throughout the 19th century. Uh, they included <coughs> things like the death of the sheep industry, which had been such a mainstay for New England farmers for quite a long time before that. They included the Civil War, which took a great many farmers off their land, of course killed off plenty of them in battle, but also, and perhaps more significantly, taught others that in the course of their travels uh, in the army, that there are places in this country where the topsoil is six feet deep, not six inches deep, and therefore uh, a great many of them uh, came home just long enough to put their tools and their families in a wagon and head off for Ohio or Missouri or the upper Midwest or any place where farming did not seem like such an act of desperation or insanity. <laughs> the result, of course, uh, was that the post-Civil War years saw an enormous amount of out-migration, especially from uh, upland areas of the Wigwood's agricultural sector. Uh, and in fact, we lost so much population during the latter years uh, of that century uh, that there are towns to this day, uh, in both in Massachusetts and my own state of New Hampshire, which have not yet managed to return to the populations that they had in 1830, um, which we can regard as kind of a peak year, um, uh, perhaps the peak year, of the small-scale New England agriculture that is now nostalgically referred to as the good old days uh, of New England's farming life. Well, this uh, 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 death of uh, regular old stone wall building, however, was not simply confined to uh, the outcome of the Civil War uh, or even to the outmigration from so much of New England's agricultural land. It also had a great deal to do with the Industrial Revolution, which did at least two things. Uh, to uh, put an end to the uh, long era of dry stone wall building. Uh, this, um, uh, one of them was of course the fact that it began to create wage jobs in the cities and developing industrial cities such as Lowell and Lawrence and Manchester and others uh, that began to draw young people off the farms uh, and put them into work uh, that was not quite as uncertain uh, as farm work. Uh, this began to change the working culture of New England and, a fairly profound way, uh, but uh, also because uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, precipitated a transportation revolution as well, first with the canals and then the railroads. Uh, these things uh, made it possible for New England to open up as a market for uh, livestock and other farm goods that were coming from better land out west, uh, and we did not fare terribly well uh, in that sort of competition uh, because the land out west was so much better than what we have here. Uh, and so that was also a factor, but perhaps the most profound one that the Industrial Revolution visited on New England farmers was the mechanization of agriculture. And this is, this bears talking about for just a minute or two. You know, the model that was brought here by European farmers in the uh, early part of the 17th century was a model that held small fields produced best. So uh, when farmers came into an area like this one here, uh, or where I live, up in central New Hampshire, uh, they tended to break the land up into smaller acreages of one to two to five acres. This was because all work was done by hand. Now imagine for a minute that you're, say, cutting hay on a tidy little three-acre piece that's nicely bound in by old stone walls. Well, if you're cutting with a scythe by hand, you can literally step right up to the edges of those walls, can't you? Cut every blade of grass in place. But by the end of the 19th century, a large number of farmers were no longer working their land that way. Instead, they were cutting their hay with a six or an eight foot cutter bar being dragged uh, behind a team of horses or oxen. When you are dragging a machine, whether it's a cutter bar or a manure spreader or, a, or a, uh, even a, uh, a plow, <laughs> you have to start turning about 20 feet before every corner in order to get the machine and the team around. That means that in every single one of these little medieval style fields, there were now four useless triangles of land. Yeah. Well, useless triangles of land are not especially popular among frugal New England farmers, and so not a few of them found uh, toward the end of the 19th century that they were digging large trenches beside old stone walls that in many cases had been put together by their own fathers or grandfathers or even partly by themselves, 
dumping the walls into them and burying them just below the surface of the ground in order to enlarge their fields uh, and make them more responsive to the new era of machine agriculture that had come along. All of these things uh, and many more helped precipitate a kind of period of recession here in New England uh, that really put a damper on the old way of life uh, that was centered around small freehold farms virtually everywhere. Uh, and so with that with population loss, it became a rather serious uh, difficulty here for New England as our cultural and our uh, economic vitality seemed to ebb away. We didn't really start to recover from that uh, until the middle of the Great Depression. And it has been posited as a kind of response to that fact that um, uh, the Depression was good for New England somehow. Well, my own parents who lived through it here did not take that view. Uh, however, I will say uh, that the Depression did do one thing for us. It dragged the rest of the country down into the hole where we'd already been living for <laughs> years, uh, thus evening the playing making it possible uh, for us to start to bounce back. And there really are quite a few things that got their start here in the middle of the Depression that seem to have uh, uh, survived and become fairly important in the economy of New England. Part of that uh, is the whole notion of a heritage uh, of heritage tourism, that type of thing, uh, uh, but also a more practical industry such as the skiing industry and the summer theater industry, uh, all of these things uh, began to take off in the uh, middle of the Depression. Um, Yankee Magazine, that great voice of New England virtue, published its first uh, edition in 1935, right in the middle of the Depression. Uh, uh, the iconic American play, Thornton Wilder's Our Town, uh, made its Broadway debut. 1938. So uh, New England uh, somehow began to find its feet during that uh, period after quite a long time, uh, uh, you might say, lying fallow uh, as a cultural place. Well, why am I talking about all this in a lecture purportedly uh, uh, centered on stone walls? Uh, because that long, sleepy time that we went into in the post-Civil War years, right on into the 20th century, ended up acting as a kind of preservative. Uh, for a great many elements of the old New England infrastructure that had been associated with its days uh, of small farm dominance. And I'm talking not just about stone walls here, although I'm certainly uh, including them, but also about the village centers, the general layout of the, uh, of the place, and the uh, agricultural uh, remnants of fields and uh, farmland that uh, had managed to survive. Uh, all of this uh, had New England remained a vital cultural and economic entity during uh, those many years uh, might have been swept away by additional development because, but because nothing came along to take its place, we still have enormous amounts of the uh, of stone walls and other structures uh, that might have been uh, uh, taken down or replaced by something else otherwise. Well, how did we get all these walls in the first place anyway? You know, the network of uh, structures made out of dry laid stone here in New England is so extensive that you might be forgiven for thinking that it was uh, laboriously built up over uh, many, many generations. In fact, we got our network of stone walls in a remarkably short period of historical time. Uh, one estimate holds that the bulk of them on a volume basis, anyway, was constructed in a mere 50 year period between about 1775 uh, and 1825. And another estimate for northern New England, the part I call home, is even briefer. It begins at about the turn of the 19th century and stretches out to uh, perhaps about 1840 or so. This is a minute amount of historical time for such a profound mark uh, on the landscape. And one of the reasons that we got uh, so much stone wall uh, in such a hurry, and I do not mean to imply here that uh, uh, no walls were built before uh, 1775 or after it uh, either. Of course, many were. Only there was a uh, certainly a, a peak period during which uh, some historians have said uh, it was a bit of a frenzy of wall building. This came immediately after the end uh, of the revolution, when of course we were not distracted anymore by having to fight a war in our own soil, uh, and so people could uh, settle down and concentrate on farming again. But another reason why we got so much stone wall so quickly. Uh, in historical terms, uh, was the ironic fact that the first choice of fencing for settlers who uh, began to turn this virgin timber countryside into uh, coherent farmland was not stone. It was the great mess that you get when you have to cut down 
uh, thousands of acres of virgin forest. So uh, our earliest fences uh, were made of pulled stumps set up in great forbidding rows uh, and split rail fences, uh, the zigzag kind. Uh, these, um, uh, of course, uh, material to build these kinds of fences was uh, uh, readily available uh, because of land clearing, uh, and so it was convenient. They also had to get rid of as much of that stuff as possible, uh, and so that was doubly convenient. The only problem with a, uh, organic type fencing is that it tends to rot over time. In addition to that, as they began to develop the landscape into farmland, uh, they discovered what all of you already know quite well, and that is that we live in a remarkably stony part of the country. <laughs> and so, along with clearing the forest, they found themselves obligated to move enormous amounts of surface stone off the land. They tended to take the stone out to the edges of the fields that they were creating uh, and simply throw it up against that fencing uh, that already existed, the stumps, the split rails, and so on. But of course, as time went by and their clearing became more and more complete, they uh, uh, began to uh, uh, run out of the kinds of materials that created those fences in the first place. And so it really just became a matter, once it occurred to them, that they could reorganize all that waste stone that was uh, also lying there uh, into uh, stout stone fences, uh, that they began to transform uh, uh, that stone. But because so much of it uh, was already lying along the fence lines. This also speeded up the uh, uh, acquisition of uh, stone walls and the transformation of their basic fencing from uh, organics into, uh, into stone. Uh, this was moving along at a fairly rapid pace as we turned into the 19th century, but then an event occurred around 1810 or 1811 that vastly accelerated the uh, building of stone walls everywhere in New England. This was the arrival of the first merino sheep uh, in our part of the country. Uh, and once these sheep uh, uh, came into common uh, usage, they did extremely well here uh, in New England, made a lot of farmers very well off indeed, uh, but also obligated them to enclose an additional thousands of acres uh, of land uh, because, of course, sheep are wanderers and uh, have to be contained in some way uh, in order to uh, avoid the embarrassment of uh, having to go to Farmer Brown next door and explain why all his corn is gone. Uh, uh, that sort of thing was, <laughs> was deeply frowned upon in colonial Europe, America. Uh, and so uh, we begin to see the professionalization of this craft about that time, very early decades of the 19th century, with gangs of men moving around the countryside, uh, making deals with farmers to put up such and such an amount of wall for such and such a price and such and such. Uh, a time. This, of course, uh, uh, vastly speeded up the building of stone walls, and it is the sheep walls uh, that we are seeing when we go off to uh, perambulate around the countryside and, uh, and suddenly find ourselves in the presence of old stone walls that seem to uh, be ubiquitous, seem to be everywhere, running up hills uh, <laughs> that are too steep to stand on, coming down the other side, running through brooks and streams, uh, traversing swamps, uh, virtually everywhere across the entire land surface of New England, it's almost impossible uh, not to run into stone walls uh, as you walk around uh, in the woods. And the vast majority of them, especially out away from population centers, uh, are related in one way or another uh, to the sheep industry. Well, this industry was robust uh, for 30 or 40 years, but um, uh, as we turn the corner into the middle of the century and get into the run-up to the Civil War, uh, it begins to lose a little steam. Uh, the uh, need for uniforms for the army uh, gave it a bit of a boost uh, during that period of time, but when the Civil War began to wind down, uh, the sheep industry began uh, to wind down with it. It was the victim uh, not just of uh, uh, a lack of demand, but also uh, as the center of gravity of New England farming began to move west and south, uh, that had a, uh, an effect on it. Uh, little events like the invention of barbed wire in 1868, uh, of course, also played an enormous role uh, in reducing the need for that kind of fencing, the switchover uh, that farmers tended to make in the aftermath of the sheep industry to a concentration on dairy, uh, combined with the uh, new availability of wire as fencing, uh, also tended to uh, depress uh, the need for and the uh, energy being put into uh, maintaining or building new stone walls. Well, how are these walls put together? There is, for you Star Trek fans, a prime directive in stone wall building. 
is this. If you're going to put a dry stone structure together and you would like it to stay together for a while, because contrary to the mythology of New England stone walls, every single one of them falls down sooner or later. So your objective when you build one is to build something that is going to fall down later, not sooner. <laughs> Do this by following the prime directive, which is to put one stone over two, or two over one. This formulation is an emblematic rule, not a literal one. In practice, you will find yourself putting three over 27, nine over eight, uh, 10 over three, etc. any combination you can think of. Uh, the point is to avoid stacking stones up directly on top of one another. This is called stack bonding. And the reason it is bad is because it separates the wall into structurally segregated sections that can then come apart much more easily over time. Well, what does that mean? After all, these are stones, right? They don't have legs, they're not trying to get away. Or are they? <laughs> <laughs> the fact is that every stone in the world has an ambition. A personal ambition to sink to the center of the earth as soon as possible. It's extraordinarily patient about waiting for an opportunity to fulfill this ambition. And when it gets one, it accepts it immediately. You know, we do have earthquakes in this region from time to time. They're not very spectacular like California standards, but they're enough. Perhaps some of you are old enough to remember the one that we had about, no, oh, I don't know, eight years ago or so. It was over on the border between New Hampshire and Maine, under the town of Sanford. A massive 4.0. We don't usually have earthquakes that big. Most of our earthquakes are like 1.9, 2.3. It can't be felt by human beings. But every time one goes across the countryside, every single stone and every wall says, hey, mm -hmm. here's my chance. <laughs> I can get a little closer to the center of the earth. And if there's any space around that stone within the structure that it occupies, it will slip or slide or otherwise contrive to get it into that space and thus move a little closer uh, to the center of the earth. This is why stone walls are like people. They tend to loosen up and spread out as they get older, <laughs> finally to fall apart completely, in spite of their best efforts to remain intact. <laughs> Earthquakes are not the only thing that does this to stone walls. Uh, changes in the way the water is moving under a wall can create erosion conditions uh, that deprive some of the wall of its uh, uh, base of support. Uh, uh, things like the expansion of tree roots that are growing a little too close to the wall can heave them up uh, and destroy them that way. Uh, simple frost heaves in certain cases can also throw them out of the line, uh, cause them to uh, begin to uh, wobble. Uneven compression from uh, one part of the wall to another can create vertical splits um, uh, as the wall struggles to uh, accommodate itself to a different kind of terrain. Uh, this uh, process goes on and on. The tunneling of animals, the clambering of other animals or human beings over the top, knock stones off them. All of these things uh, begin to conspire almost immediately uh, to begin to try and loosen up uh, and destroy uh, the structural integrity of, uh, of anything made of dry laid stone. Now, a correctly built stone wall has a certain amount of flexibility to it. It is able to adjust. Uh, to a great many of those little disturbances that come along, but eventually, of course, uh, 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 they all begin to loosen up and come apart uh, over time. Nonetheless, uh, it is possible to arrest this process or at least slow it down enough so that the stone wall uh, has a chance of lasting. Uh, it may uh, need fairly regular maintenance from time to time. You do this by making sure that every stone in the wall has multiple physical dependencies for holding its position, not just one, so that if a, uh, one of the stones that is holding it in place moves or uh, shifts a little bit and no longer provides the kind of support it was providing before, others will be in place to uh, help ensure that that stone uh, has some kind of chance to stay in its position uh, just a little bit longer. Uh, again, um, uh, eventually, uh, this kind of wearing down uh, gets to all stone walls. Uh, however, uh, a well-built one uh, ages in something that might be described as reverse dog years, uh, uh, so that uh, 50 human years have to go by before 10 uh, stone wall years in terms of aging uh, have passed. Uh, and so uh, a very well-built stone wall, uh, especially one that's more or less protected uh, in its spot, 
uh, can last for a very long time indeed, and with proper maintenance, uh, virtually forever. Well, there are some things about New England stone wall building uh, that make it a little bit different uh, from what we see uh, in other parts of the world where building in dry laid stone is very common. Uh, two, in fact. Uh, excuse me, one of them is the stone itself. In most parts of the world where they build a lot of stone walls, the available stone supply is relatively homogeneous with respect to its array of shapes and sizes. In other words, if you're in the Lake District of England or even in parts of America, for instance, the Kentucky, Tennessee, Virginia Triangle, or a great hotbed of dry laid stone wall building, uh, uh, features mostly uh, limestone outcroppings uh, that break away in uh, rough squares and rectangles, uh, fairly copacetic stone for building. Uh, in terms of its usefulness. Uh, in uh, uh, many parts of England, most of the stone is uh, shattered or broken, relatively flat, uh, and uh, again, not too terribly difficult to put together in coherent structures. Here in New England, however, we have no such situation. What we do have uh, is an enormous mess of every single shape and size, from a ping pong ball to a Volkswagen bus, uh, all mixed up together in a completely incoherent, chaotic jumble uh, that tends to differ in quality uh, rather radically from part to part of New England, uh, or even from field to field within the same town, uh, due to the uh, indiscriminate distribution process visited upon us by the uh, uh, glacial activity that, just, that took all of this stone, most of it from the Green and White Mountains, which were once taller than the Himalayas, uh, smashed it all to pieces and uh, just randomly redistributed it all over the uh, land surface uh, of New England uh, over the course of, oh, about 100,000 years or so uh, in four separate periods uh, of intense glaciation during which mile-thick sheets of ice uh, covered almost all of New England down to about Long Island or so. Uh, this was the process that uh, destroyed the green and the white mountains and then just redistributed all the stone that it found there uh, over the entire land surface uh, of New England. Uh, this created, of course, uh, a, uh, an incredible mess for the uh, first farmers who came here, uh, but it was not immediately apparent to them uh, just how messy it was. Uh, there was plenty of stone on the surface of the ground, of course, and this is uh, mostly the stone that they removed when they were first making their fields. Uh, and took out to the edges, but as they began to plow and plant and really develop the land, they discovered that two or three feet below the surface, on, uh, almost everywhere except down in the river bottoms, uh, there, was, uh, there were additional uh, enormous layers uh, of uh, either broken and shattered or else rounded and uh, uh, bowling ball-like uh, stone uh, almost everywhere. Uh, it was this stone uh, that began to truly bedevil them when they uh, began to try and plow and plant. Uh, and so enormous uh, amounts of that stone were removed from uh, within the ground as well as on the surface of it. Uh, and these two found their way into, uh, into the walls. And this is the second factor uh, that makes New England stone wall building quite different from what we see in many other parts of the world. In most of the uh, world where uh, dry laid stone wall building is common, the people who build these walls build them because they want to walk. Here in New England we did that too. Uh, but we also uh, built our walls uh, uh, in order to get rid of as much of the stone as possible. <laughs> Put it somewhere, store it within these structures uh, in a way that would get it out from underfoot. Uh, this is why so many New England stone walls are as overbuilt as they are. They are thicker, heavier, taller than walls, mm -hmm. similar walls in other parts of the world, simply to create enough interior space to stow away all those uncooperative shapes, the bowling balls, the weird trapezoids with no flat surfaces, uh, uh, the uh, deeply worn uh, and smoothed out uh, cannonballs, some of them split in half, uh, others completely intact that won't grip onto any other stones. All those stones uh, that make wall builders throw up their hands and go, I can't do anything with this piece of junk, uh, except they don't say junk. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, by, uh, by creating walls that were uh, much thicker uh, than what uh, other kinds of builders and uh, other traditions tended to uh, create, uh, they uh, turned many of their walls into essentially de facto storage structures uh, for enormous amounts of stone in order to get it out of the way. Even with these techniques, uh, they were not able to get rid of all of it, and so the New England countryside, in addition to the things they did manage to build, 
uh, is also festooned with what we call stone dumps. Uh, these are uh, enormous collections of stone uh, uh, put into uh, rough piles of one kind or another with no particular structural job to do uh, except to hold on to as much stone uh, as possible. A great many of these are now uh, invisible to us because they are buried in leaf mold out in the woods. So when you go for a little hike, you may find yourself standing on a small promontory somewhere uh, in the middle of nowhere, looking out over uh, a little stream or some view that you wanted to see, uh, completely unaware that what you are standing on is an enormous pile of stone that was put there by somebody in the uh, early part of the 19th or latter part of the 18th century uh, for the purpose of simply getting rid of all that stone. This uh, necessity uh, uh, had a huge effect on the way that our walls look. And combined with the enormous variety of shapes and types of stone, we have something on the order of 180 or 200 plus uh, different kinds of stone here in New England. It's very unusual. Uh, most uh, areas where there's lots and lots of available stone feature one or two or three kinds. Uh, we have just a, a little bit of everything, mostly because of the geological history uh, of, uh, of New England. But this uh, enormous variety can also cause our walls to look rather different from each other on a uh, on, on a wall-to-wall -wall basis. In spite of those differences in appearance, structurally speaking, there are really only two kinds of dry laid stone walls. One of them is the freestanding type, which rises into space as this model does, and shows what we call faces on both sides. Uh, and the other is the retaining wall, of course, uh, which shows a face on only one side and marks the difference between two grades of different height. The uh, principal structural difference between these two types of walls is the mathematical relationship of width to height. Stone walls must have a certain amount of mass in order to hold themselves together so that the weight of the upper courses or layers of stone uh, will press down firmly enough upon the ones that are below uh, to help them hold their position and, and uh, not respond to all those disturbing events that uh, mm -hmm. uh, immediately attack them. Uh, when they are first uh, put together. Uh, and so uh, the um, uh, relationship of width to height uh, in a stone wall is an, uh, a very critical factor. As we look at uh, some of the older work, um, uh, and my family and I, uh, who've been in business for about 45 years now, uh, up in the other Hopkinton, um, I have made a specialty out of uh, uh, out of restoration of older structures uh, as time has gone on. So we've taken apart a great many uh, antique pieces of work uh, that were done during the colonial era and even before that. What we find is that although this is not a stated rule anywhere where you find <coughs> that there is a kind of uh, governing <coughs> width to height ratio uh, for uh, both freestanding and retaining walls. It seems to work out uh, in the case of freestanding walls uh, to a relationship of about three quarters to one. And what that means is that if you are uh, proposing to create a freestanding wall that is six feet tall, uh, you must begin with a footprint, in other words, the part of the wall that actually touches the ground, uh, of uh, at least uh, four feet, three quarters of that six foot height, or it won't have enough mass to hold itself together over time. Uh, this, uh, uh, walls that are too thin for the height that they are uh, intended to reach, uh, will uh, be extremely delicate and will respond to uh, the negative stimulus of an earthquake or erosion or uh, anything else uh, much, much sooner uh, than if they had enough uh, weight and mass in them. For retaining walls, the formula is even stricter. It starts at one to one uh, and goes up from there. Uh, it was the best example. <laughs> Excuse me, I can think of as uh, an old carriage house foundation. Uh, we took apart one year with a uh, with the purpose of uh, rebuilding it and restoring it. This uh, uh, foundation was a typical New England type bank barn foundation, and by that I mean it was built into the side of a sloping hill, uh, as many, many uh, of our uh, barn foundations are. It provides access to the uh, bottom story, uh, but also protection uh, as it is partially buried uh, in a hillside. This particular foundation had eight foot tall dry laid stone walls uh, in its basement, in its cellar. But behind them, when we took them apart, we found more than 12 feet of carefully laid stone running back into the, into the hillside. 
This did not um, uh, end up in a straight up in a vertical wall on the back side, the invisible side. Rather, it was bent over in a kind of 45 degree angle. This is exactly the classic way uh, of uh, building an old-fashioned dry laden wing retaining wall. It stepped roughly up from that 12 foot width uh, to about an 18 inch cap, which is where the sill of the building sat. Um, this provided an enormous triangular reverse dam because retaining walls have to do more jobs than freestanding walls do, which after all only have to hold themselves together. Uh, 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 whereas retaining walls not only have to hold themselves together, they also have to hold back any pressure that's being exerted by the settling fill of the higher side. If they are not massive enough behind that face uh, and, and do not have enough of a reverse dam, so to speak, <coughs> the uh, pressure of that settling fill will begin to push the wall over mm -hmm. uh, from top to bottom. And if you've ever seen any retaining wall, uh, tall or short, uh, that is leaning out away from its bank, and you are looking at a retaining wall which was not correctly built in terms of the amount of mass it needed to have behind that face, <coughs> excuse me, in order to hold back uh, that settling fill. Now, retaining walls that are also foundations I uh, have yet a third job, and that, of course, is to hold up uh, uh, an enormous building of one kind or another. Uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, some of the most careful and uh, indeed beautiful uh, uh, rough and ready agricultural style of drag, uh, dry laid stonework uh, that exists here in New England uh, is not visible in the walls uh, 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 out on any uh, given farm acreage, but rather underneath the houses and the barns uh, in the foundations uh, that hold those buildings up. Um, uh, as you might imagine, uh, it is considerably difficult to repair uh, a dry laid stone wall that has <coughs> an enormous building on it than it is uh, uh, to repair one that is sitting out in open space where it's easy to get to. Uh, and so we see some of the most careful and uh, truly astounding uh, dry laid stonework uh, in those foundations. In a way, it's kind of sad that we can't just go into anybody's house and we feel like it go down there. Uh, basically, to study some of these uh, wonderful structures. Well, it seemed as the uh, uh, farmers began to uh, move away from the stone wall building in the latter part of the 19th century that this craft would uh, sort of fade away and disappear, just kind of uh, a, a forgotten part of a forgotten way of life. Uh, but during the course of the middle of the 19th century, we began to receive enormous numbers of immigrants uh, in this country from various parts of Europe where dry laid stone wall building was a respected profession. I'm talking now about countries like Ireland, of course, uh, Italy, Greece, Finland, uh, several others. Uh, and these workers who began to show up here in great numbers in the middle of the 19th century with the Irish potato famine, uh, and then uh, in the early 20th century, uh, during the Ellis Island days, uh, many of them were skilled stone workers. And they did find work, it just wasn't for the farmers. They went to work for municipalities, doing things like putting uh, dry laid stone work up around uh, reservoirs and cemeteries and so forth. They went to work for the railroads, which needed enormous amounts of infrastructure in the form uh, of culvert headers, bridge abutments, and so on. And they went to work for the wealthy, who in many cases were beginning to buy up some of the old abandoned farms and turn them into summer estates. Uh, this, of course, required landscape services of one kind or another, which often, oh, thank you so much, uh, often um, uh, included things like portal pillars down at the bases of the driveways that ran up to these estates from the main roads. You can still see some of this work in places like Jaffrey or Dublin, New Hampshire, uh, or in Mitt Romney's uh, old stomping grounds up in uh, Wolfboro. Um, uh, uh, where uh, stonework that was added later, not uh, during the era of uh, uh, small farm dominance, uh, but in the mid to late 19th century, uh, or even the early part of the 20th century. I'm mentioning this because the style of the uh, immigrant builders who came from uh, somewhat different traditions of dry laid stone wall building uh, began to affect the overall style uh, of dry laid stone wall building and uh, repair. Uh, in the region as a whole. It was tighter, it was flatter, uh, it was more uh, self-consciously conspicuous as, uh, as a, a kind of uh, artificial uh, way of creating uh, surface patterns that didn't simply depend on using every stone that came to hand, uh, but rather discriminated among stones and sought to 
uh, create uh, patterns that had a kind of uh, homogeneity to them. Uh, instead of simply letting the uh, randomness of the stone form uh, whatever patterns it felt like forming at the time it was being built. Now, this is a, an enormously uh, a significant difference uh, between the way that uh, one stone wall might look uh, and another one built uh, in a slightly different way. And the reason this was important is because these immigrant builders who uh, uh, did a, uh, began to build in a much more self-conscious and uh, 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 artistic style, if you will, uh, became the dominant teachers of the generations who ended up teaching people like me. I was taught by my uncle, who was a farmer, not a mason, uh, but he was taught by an Englishman and by a Frenchman uh, who had come here um, uh, within a generation or two and uh, uh, became uh, local uh, uh, stone wall builders and repairers, um, usually in the kind of decorative fashion. And that's been the real trend uh, in stone wall building here in England uh, since uh, the latter part of the 19th century. We're moving from a, uh, from a rough and ready, agriculturally oriented type of style uh, to one that is self-consciously decorative uh, and that is about landscaping. In fact, at this moment, we are in the midst of a, uh, a, a fairly uh, profound renaissance uh, in the uh, art of dry laid stone wall building, largely because of the great residential housing boom that began here in about the uh, mid to late 1970s, and a few bumps in the road has persisted uh, uh, throughout uh, all this time. It has created such a demand for landscaping services that almost inevitably, because this is New England, uh, includes some incorporation uh, of uh, natural stone. This has been going on for a while. Um, Stone walls became such a marker of New England's history and culture, uh, even as early as the early years of the 19th century, uh, that they, uh, the use of natural stone has become a, a kind of emblem uh, that has managed to survive several different uh, eras, uh, if you will, uh, of home construction and home style construction. It is even visible in uh, things as long ago as the uh, uh, architectural style known as the shingle style of building. This is an early 20th century phenomenon, uh, but it's a good example of how stonework has managed to adapt itself here in New England to a variety of purposes and a variety of uh, uh, movements in terms of the way things are built and how they are made to look. It's a very good example in some of the nice little cottages that you see, perhaps uh, one that was built in 1918 or 1923, where the knee walls and the pillars that are holding up the porch out front are all made of tiny little smooth river stones, all mortared together in a little pattern. Uh, this is a, uh, an adaptation of the uh, shingle style of building uh, to home architecture that incorporates uh, what was already clear about New England, which is that it uses its enormous amount of stone uh, as a kind of uh, touchstone, if you will, of uh, architectural and uh, vernacular building style. Well, as you can see, there's a great deal to be uh, said about this uh, subject, and I want to turn this conversation over to you as soon as possible. Uh, for those of you who would like to uh, know more, uh, let me give you just a little information about some of these books that I have with me. Here are two general histories of New England stone wall building. This one is a social history. It is sort of the grandmother of all recent writing uh, about uh, New England stone walls, including my own. Uh, it was written by Susan Allport. It came out at the beginning of the 1990s. Uh, it's uh, still in print, readily available, and it is probably the, uh, the best uh, uh, general story of how we got all these walls uh, and what they were used for, how they were put together in the first place. This book is Stone by Stone by uh, a geology professor from the University of Connecticut named Robert Thorson. Uh, he takes a much more quantitative approach in telling exactly the same story uh, that Ms. Allport uh, tells in her book, but he tells it from the perspective of a scientist. And so if your interest is in the geological history of New England uh, or in uh, uh, things like the distribution of particular types of stone in particular parts of the region, uh, as well as the uh, uh, general overall story of how these walls all came to be, uh, then his book is quite valuable as well. He's also responsible for this handy little handbook, which you were meant to carry with you when you go perambulating around the countryside so that you can look up the dates of settlement of any um, place you happen to be in or uh, check out what kinds of moss and lichen happen to be growing on the 
uh, stones that you discover. That book is very useful for that. There are approximately three and a half million books about using stone in gardens. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the better ones. It's by Gordon Hayward, who lives across the river in Vermont, uh, where he designs gardens with his wife. Uh, and if you're somebody who uh, loves the contrast of hardscape stone with the delicate planting, uh, that book is uh, enormously useful. Uh, this book is completely unique. There is no other book like it. It is uh, called Good Fences, a pictorial history of New England stone wall building. It was by a Mainer uh, named William Hubble, uh, who has done us all the enormous favor of traveling deeply throughout New England and photographing virtually every single kind of uh, old dry laid stone structure that exists or has been built. Uh, it's a, a little odd that nobody thought to do this before he did it about eight or nine years ago. Uh, but this book is quite marvelous, and he also provides very uh, detailed captions with lots of information in them. But of course, the bulk of the book is his beautiful photographs, mm -hmm. including this one, which I know you can't see, but I'm going to leave it open for those of you who would like to see it. It is a single photograph that will leave no doubt in your mind how it is that we acquired 250,000 miles plus of dry laid stonework here in New England. Uh, it's a little piece of ruined farmland in upstate New York with the old medieval pattern of one and two and three acre fields, all in squares and rectangles. Uh, it's perfectly represented in the stone walls that remain, you can see down through those leafless trees. You take a look at that uh, photograph and then project what you see in it across every arable inch of New England and quite a few non-arable ones as well. Uh, you will be amazed that we only ended up with 250,000 miles uh, of dry stone. This uh, book is also uh, quite unique, and it's one of two out-of-print ones that I have in my little uh, collection. You can acquire copies of this volume uh, if you are dedicated enough uh, and are willing to shell out several hundred dollars on the internet, uh, even for copies that aren't in the lousy condition that mine is in. Um, uh, it is not about New England. It is not even about America. But I wanted to show it to you because it is one of the most spectacular books ever put together about uh, dry laid stone wall building. It was written in 1977 by a Swiss architect named Werner Blazer. Uh, it is called The Rock is My Home, uh, or in German, uh, Der Fels ist mein Haus. Um, uh, it is simultaneously printed, in fact, in French, German, and English, in case you want to brush up on your French or your German when you're reading about spectacular stone sites in Europe, including these sheep walls that are depicted on its cover on the Aran Islands off the coast of Ireland. They are five and six feet high. And these buildings in the north of Italy, again, I'll leave this open for those of you who want to look at it, in which entire structures, walls, and roof are made of dry laid stone. How confident would you be going to sleep under the <laughs> loose boulders in an earthquake-prone region? And yet these buildings, entire villages, in fact, uh, have been built this way. Here's my other little out-of-print book, and this is a very curious book indeed. Uh, it's called The Forgotten Art of Building a Stone Wall. It was written in 1971 uh, by a nice old gentleman named Curtis Fields, who retired to a, a little town in Vermont and um, became fascinated by stone walls. Uh, and decided that he would create an instruction book uh, for those uh, uh, who wanted to learn to build them, because in his view, uh, the craft had uh, disappeared from common use, uh, and uh, he wanted to contribute to its uh, rebirth. The only difficulty with Mr. Fields uh, as a writer of instruction books is that he either lived in or chose to work with uh, only stone uh, that was square. <laughs> and so, <laughs> if all your stone is square, it's a great instruction book. <laughs> if you live in New England, it's a terrible instruction book. <laughs> it doesn't help you at all. Uh, however, the book has other significance, namely its publication date. It was printed uh, in 1971, exactly 100 years after the Federal Report on Fencing, uh, and it forms a kind of ironic bookend, if you will, uh, with that uh, report um, uh, because uh, the uh, uh, federal report fencing, uh, which uh, set out to be a kind of celebration, if you will, ended up being uh, an inadvertent eulogy uh, for the end of the era of common understanding of dry laid stone construction, <coughs> simply because of when it appeared. 
uh, at a moment when the craft itself was beginning to fade uh, in, uh, in, in practice among New England farmers. Uh, and uh, whereas Mr. Fields' uh, alleged instruction book uh, has a, uh, an opposite irony, it appeared in 1971, uh, just a year or two or three before the beginning of the great uh, uh, beginning of the great renaissance of dry laid stone wall building that was associated with landscape mm -hmm. services um, uh, that resulted from uh, the residential housing boom uh, that we then went into. And so Fields' book, which was um, conceived as a conscious eulogy for the loss of a, uh, of a particular skill among members of the general public, actually turns out to be a kind of harbinger uh, <laughs> of the beginning uh, of the new era of dry laid stone wall building. Uh, the fact is that there are probably more people right now, today, uh, learning and practicing this craft than have been active in it for at least the last hundred years. Uh, and so we are in no danger whatsoever uh, of losing this craft and the um, uh, new interest in uh, building new walls for landscape purposes has also led to a renewed interest in repairing and preserving uh, uh, the best examples of the older work uh, that we have among us. Uh, and so uh, we are in no danger of losing this craft anytime soon. Uh, 